and welcome to Music City Listeners. I'm your host, Dewey Boyd, and I wanted to know how people find their place in the music industry. So I've started asking the best listeners I can find how they did it, or maybe how it happened to them. Join me, won't you? We'll start with a simple, where are you from? And we'll see where this all goes. So tonight we're here to listen to Tim Lauer. And uh, so for this first part, we'll be talking. We'll take a break and you can get some more of the delicious wraps and fruit. And um, and then for the second half, we'll do just kind of open Q&A. So, so here we go. Tim, where are you from? I grew up, <coughs> well, I went to grade school in Japan. And then I went to junior high and high school in northern Wisconsin. Tiny little town. So what... Uh, how did you, how did your family end up in Japan? Well, my parents were dorm parents at a missionary boarding school. So, you know, there would be people living out in the, you know, the rural areas of Japan and they would send their the American kids <clears throat> to a boarding school. So we had a house full of 20 high school boys, juniors and seniors, and I was a kid and it was, it was awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. So, uh, and, and so you moved to Wisconsin. In, where? Well, we were in Chicago for a year, um, and then we went to Northern Wisconsin. Ribla. It's it's seven hundred and twenty forty two people. Seven hundred forty two people, and forty eight kids in my high school class. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. So it's not exactly the kind of town where people like go work in the entertainment business. Right. Yeah. Small pond. Yeah. Small pond. Um, yeah, so uh, how did you come become interested in, in music or, or even then pursuing that, that love toward the entertainment industry? Well, my, my dad was uh, church music when I was younger, so I was fascinated with that. And I just always remember in any kind of instrument, any kind of television show, anything with music I was, I was all in. And I, you know, I made a homemade drum set and I... I would buy instruments at garage sales, and and I started taking piano lessons and and guitar lessons, and then I had a paper out, and I bought a four track, and I had a bass, and I had a drum set, and I had a synth, and and I was recording a four track, and then bouncing down to three tracks, then to one, and then having three more, and then I, you know, <clears throat> doing all that. And how old were um, you doing that, just for oh, like context sake? Like high high school. That's amazing. You know, like I mean, this is before Logic and yeah. your laptop, so yeah. it was get you know it was yeah. tape, you know, <clears throat> and so I had I had a room that was just for instruments and music and and I think I had acoustic guitars, electric. Guitars. I bought it all with paper out money, you know, and started a, a pet band in junior high because I just was like, man, I can't wait for a pet band, you know. <laughs> So I'd, I'd ha I wrote out parts so there would be like uh, key of C melody and then B flat transposition melody, E flat transposition melody, F transposition melody, and then accompaniment one and two in C, E flat, B flat, and F for the in case the French horn player showed up, and then bass <laughs> in C and B flat. So if a trumpet player showed up, he got the B flat melody, and then the flute player would get the C melody, and then the two saxes would get, you know, the tenor would get the B flat, and the alto, or, yeah, is that right, and the alto would get the E flat, and they'd have come in, so we're covered, and then, you know, I would say, I guess I better play a bass, and then I'd get a bass and play the bass part, or I'd play it on trombone, an octave up, or a tuba, or whatever, you know. At what point did you realize that that's highly unusual? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just it seemed like what made sense, and then I was in 4-H in this very um, agricultural. Town. Yeah, it was mink ranches, dairy farms, mm -hmm. Christmas tree farms, you know, a lot of dairy farms, mm -hmm. and so 4-H was huge, and I was a town kid, you know, and so I did, <laughs> I did the plays and the music, and then I had a band called Odyssey, and it was called Odyssey because we had a video game. And one of the first video games was Odyssey 2, okay. it's called. And I would trade, I couldn't get people to rehearse. So I, I would trade them, and uh, if they would come rehearse for an hour, they could play my video game for an hour. <laughs> and then I would go write more stuff <laughs> while they were in my house playing the video game. And we named the band after the video game. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and then we played like 4-H functions and yeah. like the skating rink and whatever. I've been to a 4-H function, so I know oh, it's how. It's pretty happening. <laughs> yeah. I know. I have an idea. Of what mm-hmm. <laughs> you're judging st- like steer over yep. here and yeah. you're on the grand st- <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. But and then we had in my in my high school they had a subscription to Musician magazine. Okay. Um which I guess is still around, I think. But it was they had all these like grainy black and white pictures of like people smoking cigarettes and, and headphones with curly cords and the and the headphone like big Sennheiser Gorkas headphones, you know. And, you know, in in the studio, and I was like, whoa, that is just, I mean, it blew my mind. I would just stare at these pictures of, you know, people in the studio. And I was like, that, that is what I want to do. And I wanted to be a studio drummer. Steve Gadd was my hero. Opened my locker. I had a picture of Steve Gadd. Steve Gadd is, is, uh, it was called uh, Black, see, Ebony Piano Finish. His drum sets, and he had black sticks. I was like, whoa, this is incredible. <laughs> and um, we had a public library that got records, and I would use paper and money. And I got the record that changed my life was Quincy Jones, The Dude. And it said, Quincy Jones, it was his name, but they didn't sing on it, he didn't play on it, he didn't write any of the songs, he didn't mix it. I thought, what in the world? <clears throat> there was an article in Musician Magazine, and he's like, well, I have picked these songs by these songwriters I like. I picked these singers, <clears throat> picked these musicians. The whoa, that's got to be incredible. You get the song, and then you get to cast among all these world-class musicians who's going to play on it and guide it. And I, I just and I memorized all the credits. I knew. Oh, I, I mean, I can you can I can. There are certain records you can play a song, and I'll tell you what the next song is, and who played on, what everybody played on that track, you know, I was just, because I had the turntable, I had the Harman Kardon turntable, and the Techniques turntable, and I had the the, cur- the headphones, like in the picture, the white headphones with the curly cord, a beanbag chair, I'd sit there, look at this vinyl, it was like just tripping out, you know. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a record that I thought, okay, so a record producer, and, and mm. then people would ask me, <clears throat> Oh, so you're into music. What do you play? And I would always say, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I knew at that point, I, what, I, what I was figuring out was that it wasn't about uh, the instrument or facility. I mean, it is. Right. But it, that, I, I, did that, I was trying to say that's not my focus. My focus mm. is it's not, I'm not a piano player. Like, I'm a musician. Mm. You know, or, I, or I do music. And I, so I was, even then... You know, junior high school was really resisting the. Um, so what do you play? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. But and the answer also was that I did play a lot of different instruments. Right. And I in the band, we had a great band teacher who I'm still in touch with, and we every year I would play a different instrument. I'm like, I want to play French horn next year. Great, take a French horn over the summer, and I was just uh, figure it out, you know. Yeah. And then you know, in the jazz band, I'd say I played drums in the jazz band in eighth grade, and just you know, with the big band, I was. I mean, in heaven. But then in one year, I was like, I want to play bass, you know, and I wanted to, yeah. boom, 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 you know, and so I would just sit there and learn all that stuff. <clears throat> and, you know, I go to Pet Band and like, I want to play trombone because you can really overblow it and splats out. Right. It was more yeah. fun. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so I was, I mean, it, it was, I was a bit of a sort of overachiever. <laughs> Get te- definitely geeked out. I had a drum set in my room. My parents <clears throat> would, the rule was shut the door and then done at 10. Okay. But it'd be like 9.59 and I've got <laughs> headphones on playing along with records like wearing it out. And I can't even imagine, from like after school until 10. Wow. I can't even, my mom, I can't even imagine that there's got to be times <laughs> when she just wanted to scream. But never complained. You know? Wow. <clears throat> wow. Uh, do you, do you have- Siblings or yeah, my brother. He's a math guy. Never, yeah. never cared about music. Wow. He just stayed in some other room with earplugs or. Yeah, I kind of. He never really complained. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was he was more social. Okay. So okay, so you. That's by the way, as far as like what anyone has told me about their childhood, that is the most anyone had like gotten into it. <laughs> It's 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 amazing. That's 
incredible to like go that deep in as, as like a high school student. Um, so, so what happened after but high I was school? also writing for, I would write for the choir and I was writing yeah. for the big band. Wow. So I was writing, I had score paper um, that would be like, you know, four trumpets, yeah. four trombones, five saxes, rhythm section. And uh, I was very, took it very seriously. I had the arranging books and I wanted to be a film composer, arranger. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I won the Lawrence University Young Jazz Composer Award. And, you know, I think it was like Ain't She Sweet was one of the songs I did an arrangement of. And then I did Spinning Wheel, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Spinning mm. Wheel for Big Band. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I, I went back up to my school a couple of winters ago, and the, and the jazz band did it, you know. And I kind oh, of, really? I kind of rehearsed them through. It was really fun. You know? Oh, man. <laughs> That's great. I think actually my jazz band in high school did spinning wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And it charts I wonder if they got a hold of It still kind of held up. It, it worked okay still. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so after high school, what where'd you go? Well, uh, the summer between my uh, sophomore and junior year, I toured with this group called the Reach Out Singers. I think they're out of uh, Omaha or somewhere in North Dakota or something. And I played piano. We played in Lutheran churches all over the country. And went to the UK for a few weeks, and it was like you know typical like eight singers and piano, piano player. They were all twenties and thirties, and I was fifteen, you know. And <laughs> then um, I and I awesome went things. as the I was gonna play drums. I went as mm. a drummer, and then like one of the piano players for one of they had like six groups that all rehearsed together, and then they would put these people together. And they came to me and said, "We're one piano player short. Somebody flaked out on us." And I said, oh, okay, so I'll play piano. So I would rehearsed on drums all week, and then I went over to piano for the, for the tour. Um, and then two days after I graduated from high school, I, two days, I left and I played with a show band called, um, the group, it was out of Cincinnati, American Entertainment Production, out of Columbus, American Entertainment Productions. And they would do like... Uh, the Texas Instruments Convention in uh, Topeka, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you'd go to a ballroom, and we had, we had a horn section and a rhythm section, and then two girls and two guys. And we had like white um, polyester pants, white Capizio dance shoes, a red puffy pirate shirt, and a uh, <laughs> sequined vest. And it would be like, um, it's like it was like a Disneyland show, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then we'd do like the, the girls' country medley. And then it would be like, working nine to five, you know? And, the, and then we'd do 30 seconds of that and then something else. Yeah. And then, and then it'd be the guys' country medley. And the guy would come out with braids. Maybe I didn't love you. We'd, you know, all this stuff. And then we would do like the Broadway medley, and you know? Yeah. And, but it was great because I learned a bunch of tunes. Right. And um, well, it was touring. You know? Yeah. And I think we got 100 or 120 bucks a week. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're a check. <clears throat> okay. And uh, $15 a day per diem cash. Mm. And I was like, man, I am a rich man. You yeah. know? <laughs> but we had to eat. Usually dinner was provided, but we had to do lunch. But 15 bucks, maybe it might have been 10. But it was like, I had, I could save that, you know. Just oh, like yeah. McDonald's for lunch for nothing. And, and uh, I can't imagine McDonald's every day. <laughs> and, you look uh, great. <laughs> I don't feel so hard. But, yeah. um, so I did that and then went straight from that to study with Bill Purcell at Belmont. Okay. Who was a string arranger and he had scored some films and he played with Patsy Cline. And, mm. He was he was he was a pretty well known, um, kind of, at a point in his career where he was slowing down in, in teaching. Yeah, he seemed old. He was probably my age, you know, but he seemed like he was, you know, done it all and yeah, you know, out to pasture, you know. Wow, resting on his past achievements. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it was it was a lot. You know, it seemed like a lot to me. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then he really, um, he was really tough on me in a great way, you know? Like, I remember my first lesson I did, <clears throat> I think it was like, it might have been, I think I did, Stevie Wonder, All in Love is Fair, All is Fair in Love, whatever, what's the title? All yeah, is All is Fair in Love. All is Fair, fair in love. love. And I did it for strings, 
oboe, French horn, and vocal. And I don't think it'd be piano. It was just like an orchestral thing, you know. And I was really proud of it. And it probably wasn't all that bad, but I went in and I wasn't quite finished. And he was like, you're not done. It's like, yeah, I had this Western Civ thing and then I had the two tests in a row. And he was just like, but you're not done. If this was a session, you don't come in and say, oh, I had a Western Civ thing and my kid's birthday party and my baby. And then I got sick and then my wife had to come back. She, her car broke down. He's like, no, no, you just get it done. You stay up. What time did you go to bed last night? I was like, 11. It's like, oh, poor baby. Yeah. He's like, you know, you drink some coffee and you get it done. Yeah. And if you think you want to be a professional, I don't believe in you. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Because mm -hmm. you don't want it bad enough. Mm -hmm. And you don't care. I care. You know who your competition is? Me. I'm still working. I'm your competition. Wow. Come back when you're serious. He goes, plus, what note is that? Is that an A or B? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that an A or B? I, I, I don't know. He goes, don't leave yet. And then he gets out a calculator and he says, here's how big your group is. <clears throat> here's how much the studio will cost. Here's how much engineer costs. Here's how much an assistant costs. And you just took 26 seconds. And so that costs this amount of money. So you're late, you're late and you're messy, and you want to be a pro and take my work. I don't think it's going to happen. And, and, you know, and, I was like, and he goes, I'm not kidding. You should go. And that was the first lesson, and it was the best thing oh, man. ever. Because uh, I realized, okay, this is, yeah. this is not the music friendship. It's the music business. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was I was seventeen, you know. So it was like well, I had n nobody had ever talked to me like that. It was all touchy feely. Nice yeah. job. And all of a sudden it was like okay. Yeah. I remember one time back when uh, when I worked at Smokestack and you were around and you were, I think, probably Tony Lucido was probably there, which is why the story would have come out, but you went and talked to Belmont, mm -hmm. some kids at Belmont, and you had told them, I think, part of that story, but at least you, you, you know, asked them to look around and well, ask them who their competition was. Well, I said, I said, look around and point to your competition. And, and then so they were like pointing at each other and I said, you guys, me. <laughs> I'm your competition. You got to get work from me, and I'm here winning some award. So I'm gonna work tomorrow, and you're not. I'm your competition. <laughs> you know. And then I said, uh, uh, how how many people here are music majors? Almost everybody. Okay. How many people have a backup plan or a plan B? You know, right, probably raise their hand. I said, how many people have absolutely no escape hatch, no plan B, no backup? And about four people raised their hand. I said, I'm betting on you four, and two of you aren't good enough. I just know it. <laughs> so if you are in this room and you have a plan B, and then I go, take it now. You know, like, <laughs> just like, because, <laughs> because this is going to work, because this is, <laughs> not the music friendship and it, this is hard and it's going to work on you it's going to grind on you and at some point you're going to go Whew, this is tough I'm going to take my bag up so just take it now have a little Pro Tools rig in your, in your bedroom yeah. play in a band it'll be, it'll be great you're not giving up you're just not cut out for this <laughs> Tony thought it was amazing oh yeah if you guys <laughs> The for the maybe I'm, one or two people in this room who know Tony Lucido, you would appreciate how much he would appreciate. I think that the fact that he was like, life. "Oh no, no, but, but stay in school." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Not kids drop out of school. <laughs> I won't get asked to speak at a school. I'm sure. That's um, so. So you so you went to Belmont mm -hmm. and you took the other classes too. Did you, you how you mean how, like general? Well, you, general? you took Western Civ, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. General. Yeah. So did you go all the I way? I liked school. I I, yeah. I it never really bummed me out to. So did you did you do the whole school thing or did mm -hmm. you leave early? Okay. I um, I, you know my I my parents, I I think they bought me an old beater car that barely made it. I think it was a, um, was it a rab, VW Rabbit or something like that? You know. Yeah. And I drove it from Dallas. They had moved to Dallas right. by then. And the summer that I graduated, they moved from Wisconsin to Dallas. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of it. So everything else, I was kind of covering yeah you know and I just I didn't want to work a job job mm -hmm. 
And so I started playing piano for voice lessons. And I think it was 10 bucks a lesson, which is pretty good money. Mm -hmm. I think for a half hour lesson. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, so it was a classical lesson that I'd have to sight read. That wasn't as fun or I wasn't as good, but I took a few. Yeah. And to practice some of that stuff, but it was a good challenge. And then the commercial voice lessons were jazz standards and pop songs and stuff. And but then I'd also often have to change key, like they would be singing, um, and and yeah. you know you you might be reading out of a, like a real like a just sheet music kind of thing, and they'd say they would just try to step up, and I'd have to just you know, so that was really good training, mm -hmm. um, and I learned a bunch of songs. Also got to see different voice teachers working with singers, which eventually helped me because because I'm not a singer, but uh, you know I enjoy working with singers. It's like people that can teach you how to water ski from the back of the boat. You know, yeah. That can't water ski. But they can watch you water ski and help you learn to water ski. It's kind of my vocal thing. Um, <clears throat> and then I was playing timpani in the orchestra. <laughs> Which really <Not> is... <laughs> I mean, like, we have season tickets to the National Symphony. And I just... Yeah, you know, like I just stared at the Timothy player like, you're the luckiest guy in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't think of anything cooler than oh, showing up there and bringing up my sticks and laying them out there <laughs> to the thing. You know, oh. But I, you know, I, I didn't, I, I missed my calling on that or I missed my window. But I was playing timpani in the orchestra. That job probably doesn't open very often. No. Well, I mean, it, you know, they open up. You got, you got to be willing to start well, somewhere small. Yeah. And, um, and the concert master was Chris Latham, who was married to Trisha Yearwood. And he called me and said, hey, Trisha's got a gig. It, I think it was at like Lee University or something. You know? one, of, one of the schools between either here in Memphis and here in Chattanooga, one of, you know. And we play piano and we're doing like Linda Ronstadt and, and I, I don't know who else, probably... Um, Amy Lou Harris and some pop stuff and uh, so we put together a set and um, started playing like fairs and rodeos and gigs with Trisha before she had a record deal yeah <laughs> and then she got a record deal and I uh, well let's see one year well I started getting sessions I never even, I don't know how because I didn't really try it just <laughs> yeah yeah but one of the things was this woman um it might have been because it was cheap because this woman um was doing theme songs for wwe not wwf but wwe right that's right that's like the junior varsity version or something i don't know that changed the name yeah it changed the name okay I'm what Okay, well... It was, yeah. Okay. Um, so, th these um, wrestlers wanted the themes, or somebody had the idea that they would each have a theme song <laughs> as they walked out. And so what they did is they went to each wrestler and said... This wasn't on your website anywhere. If you, could have, if you could have a theme song, what famous song would it sound like? So that it might be like... Oh, Hugh Lewis, The Power of Love, you know. And, you know, or... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then this woman, um, somehow we, I met her and she told me that I could write them. She was going to let me write them. And she was also going to pay me $100 each. Oh, now, <laughs> knowing now just what a Panera ad pays, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, let alone a, you know, Windows 8 or something, you know. Um, I was like, $100? Are you freaking kidding me? And she said, I'll let you play in the sessions if you want. I mean, I, I, I can't pay you extra, but you can play yeah. if you want. Yeah. Well, sure. So I wrote these songs. And um, then we went down to Omni, which is still, yeah. We went down to Omni. We had a band. And I had an old station wagon and I had a rack with... It was all, you know, no laptops. So I had yeah. racks and synths and all this stuff. Took it down to Omni. It was hot, of course. I'm just loading in all this, this gear. 
and set up and you know did my power of love knockoff and and you know something from a karate kid knockoff and yeah. all, all this kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like uh, I remember Ric Flair oh because he wanted one like Footloose you know mm, Footloose so I said Flair <clears throat> Ric Flair <laughs> take on Flair if you dare you know so that was Ric I did Ric Flair I did Rowdy Roddy Piper is that his name oh my God. I had one for him I didn't know anything about it but I had and then I found out later that these were like like real deal guys, you know? And that they were using my songs as they came into the arena. And I never once thought, I only got a hundred bucks for that? I was just like, I wrote that song. <laughs> uh, so oh, man, so I was doing amazing. that, I, I did that, I did Trisha, but there were 10 of them, you know? So yeah. a thousand bucks. Oh, and um, then Janine Walker, who was the wife of an arranger, music director, producer guy, named Bill Walker, who worked on Hee Haw and the Opry and the, the, the Styler Brothers show and stuff, um, called her while I was playing for someone's lesson and said, is there anybody over Belmont that can cover with Jim Ed Brown at the Opry tonight? And uh, Jim Ed Brown, was a, he was old school then, and um, needed a piano player. So I rode my bike down Music Row from Belmont to the UA Tower. You know where that is? Hmm. It's, it's kind of, it's real pitiful now, but it was, it was the highest building in Music Row yeah. then, the hmm. UA Tower. And he had an office at the penthouse at the top that had view around, you know. And I went up there and he gave me five charts and a cassette. And he played a couple songs off the cassette. And he goes, do you think you can handle this, son? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I'll see you tonight. And so I rode my bike back up there, and I, I don't know what it, I guess I went to my room with the cassette deck and learned these things. And then went out to the Opry, no rehearsal. Um, it was a 7.30 show on Friday night, which, is their, which was their televised right. thing. And I went out, and I didn't even meet the band. They were really rude to me in the dressing room, very mm -hmm. dismissive. And um, we played Papa Top, which is Papa Top, boom, boom, boom. It was like a, like a you know, walking bass thing. Mm -hmm. And we did Deep in the Valley, little Jimmy Brown was part of the Three Bells, so his big songs, you know. And Roy Acuff, uh, you guys probably don't even know who these people are. So he said, comes over to Jimmy and he goes, well, Jim, it looks like you got a new boy on the piano. And, and Jim says, well, I reckon I do. And so he walks over to me, oh, and this is all televised, and he says, first time on the Opry, son? And I said, uh -huh. And he said, where are you from? And I said, Wisconsin. And then he looked at the audience, and the audience all laughed. He looked at me, he looked at them. I didn't get the joke. <laughs> I, I didn't get the joke. And then he says, walks real slow back to Jim, and he goes, Jim? Did you know you got a Yankee in your band? And Jimmy says, well, I reckon I do now. And, <laughs> and then I went and, and uh, did, did gigs with them. It was, it was bizarre. That's so bizarre. And he would say really inappropriate things on stage. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's really... It's, and then... Uh, <laughs> But it was all these bizarre Belmont connections, you know. One, this guy was an engineer, had a wife who had a four-girl singing group. They were on MTM Records. Trisha was answering the phone at MTM Records as receptionist, and they were called The Girls Next Door. They had a record deal. So I was a senior, and I was playing for a label artist. And uh, we'd go out on the weekend. I'd miss Friday classes sometimes or Monday morning classes and play our, you know, play our gigs on the weekend. And, <laughs> wow. That's so, so and, then, and then it went to Trisha. Yeah. Okay. And then we were playing scene. It was called Fanfare. It was like, what's happening tonight? Yeah. Down there. I was with Trisha. And Which shows how oblivious I was to that, scheduling this the same night that that begins. Yeah. That was a strong move on my part. Uh, yeah. Some people just don't want to get out, you know? Yeah. Or they're busy, you know? Yeah. So um, I. Uh, uh, Willie Weeks was playing, and he was one of my session-playing musician heroes. Mm -hmm. Willie, we Willie Weeks was playing. If you don't know Willie Weeks, look up Willie Weeks. And he was playing bass with Winona. And I went up to him, and I said, you know, hi, Willie Weeks. <laughs> you know? 
And and I talked to him for a minute and asked him about a few records he played on, like Brandy Newman and, and uh, Little Criminals, which I loved, and and um, a couple other things. And um, he said, I'll stick around what you said. And so about two weeks later, I got a call. My hey, man, it's Willie Weeks. Whoa. And he says, you want to come play with Y? And he said, you got to audition. So he told me what songs. And of course, he had to go to the record store. <laughs> And buy the song, buy the CDs because oh, you can't, you know. Yeah. Tell me what songs, and then then I had to like, how am I going to learn these? And I would like be in a hotel. I would go to this. Do we have a, Do you have a piano in a ballroom somewhere or something? Yeah. And I would try to grab some time, and I'd be on Trisha's sound check practicing for an audition for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that. I got the gig. And I was you know thrilled. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it, she was a touring with Clint Black. And it was all, it was the up-down horns who had just done, um, there were Stones, wow. and um, Russ Kunkel, who's a legendary session drummer from L.A., he was playing drums, and Willie, of course, and, you know, a great band. And so then I went in with my was manager to meet, and he says, he says, well, what kind of money are you used to making? And I just got real nervous, and I was what kind of money are you used to making? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, he goes, he goes, fair enough. He goes, what kind of money would you like to make? And I like tripled my Trisha thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I told him, and he goes, sounds, sounds about right. And I said, okay. <laughs> and my wife, she would drove, she drove and went back out. She was sitting in the car and. And I was like, you won't believe what they're going to pay me. You know, she's like, what? And, and, and I said, I asked for it. And he gave it to you? You know, so, and that was, that was a whole new, wow, whole new situation then. You know, they asked me, uh, what, what kind of rig do you want? And so I told them, well, here's, you know, here's, so I drew out, you know, a little yellow legal pad, like a 20 space rack, number down here. And I said, a power ship here, all this stuff. This is like, this is my rig, and these are the controllers here, and blah, blah, blah. And then, then they said, they called me about three days later, and said, hey, can you come down to um, SIR? You, we got your rig set up. And I go, oh, no, no, my rig is, and, 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 and I think, did I have courage by then? I don't know. My rig is wherever it was. And they're like, no, we bought you a rig. <laughs> so I went down there, and it was like they had bought everything that. It's like a carbon copy of your. Yeah, brand new. And they had a keyboard tech, and he said, just press this button for this song, and press this button for this song, and they had stereo wedges. I never even had touched my gear, you know, it was, it was amazing. And, and we were in, you know, Four Seasons Hotels, and it was just like, woo-hoo! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, are there any stories from that tour you could tell? <laughs> well, when Ona, uh, she took her dogs. So stuff like, you know, being at the Tonight Show and they're pooping on the, stage and getting people <laughs> fed and, you know, problems in hotels with the dogs and... What about, didn't you have kind of a competition with someone else in the band? Oh! I don't know if you... I don't think I want to tell that okay, story. Okay, great. But we... Fine. Yeah, there was... I remember that story. Yeah, there's several stories. you can tell. It was... It was... It was uh, fun. It was... You know, the thing... I was Trisha Yearwood's band leader and I was very young and I had a lot of pressure from her and from her manager who was Ken Cragen in LA, really trying to get this thing at a really high level really fast. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot on her, and um, I mean, I don't want, there's things I just, I don't have recorded, but um, it was just, it was a lot. And I had to fire people, and I was just put in some very uncomfortable positions for a young person to, to yeah. like fire people 10 or 15 years older than me with families that, we're doing just fine, but but maybe she didn't like the Hawaiian shirt they wore last night. True story, you know. And so um, I was always in the, and they were they would come to me and say we need a raise or we need to be paid for rehearsals or we need to pay be paid for days off on the road when when she doesn't want to go back for whatever reasons and we're stuck out here, you know. It's okay. So I'd go ask, say the guys want. She goes, well, let's give him band meeting. And then he'd be like, okay, everybody, Tim says. They'd be like, oh, no, no, we're cool with whatever. 
<laughs> and they had just all come to my room and said, I need to fight for them to have the thing. Right. And then she says, he says, you want this? And they were like, nah, I don't know. It was, where it was, where it was comfortable for you. Oh, and so it was all this kind of... So when we got to Winona, I was thrilled that we had her bus and our bus. Mm. And everybody had their own business arrangement. So we couldn't talk about money mm. because it, work your own thing out. Yeah. And we had legendary people, we had young people, and we had and people on salary, people on show pay. It's, I, I don't want to know. Yeah. And she was on her own bus. I didn't care if I ever talked to her. I didn't care if I ever, if she knew my name. I was just like, I want to hang out with the band. Yeah. So it was, it, it, there were a lot of super bizarre things about that, but it was always kind of like our bus, your bus, and it's fine. So, um, it, I guess, maybe catches up timeline, like kind of where. So where uh, okay, at that point I'm twenty seven, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And then so because I know like you know you have your studio spot over in Berry Hill and you do production work and yeah continue. Well, so then stuff, okay, so, so then the late twenties, I think I did a, a tour after Winona with Susan Ashton and Margaret Becker out of the Gray, the Christian tour. I was writing songs on the road so my wife was writing songs on the road so we started having publish, publishing meetings she went into tree Sony tree and they offered her a deal this is after going through various people we had a little four track where we'd make our guitar vocal drum machine guitar bass vocal four tracks you know. and she got a deal they offered her a deal they said who's this Tim on here is he your brother or what they said it's my husband they said does he want a deal <laughs> and she came and I mean it's a different different world now I'm yeah. sorry to, I mean it's yeah. like it's some of this stuff it's not like because I was so great or anything it's just because it was a different world um, and she said they want to know if you want to publish a deal and I said what does that mean and she says they just give you money and you write songs it's like sure so we, I had lunch with them and they just told me the deal and they said like, we'll pay for all the recordings you can go into big studios and record and, and I said well you're paying me to write songs, but part of the deal isn't that I produce them and play on them and engineer them, because if I do, I could have paid somebody else to do them. Right. So I want to charge you for all that. They're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it was built in, at that point it was built at work because she had a deal and I had a deal. We just book any old studio we wanted to. I called all the studio musicians I respected. Mm. So I got to hang with them and I was a producer. Playing, you know, doing our song. They, we could do anything. We could put string quartets on the things and just horn sections and all this stuff. Oh, man. And um, we, we did, like, we did a demo session at least once a month. And we'd, we could spend a thousand bucks on a demo. I didn't care. It was just over and over and over, you know. Um, and I would spend all this time mixing the stuff and then taking it home and listening and comparing and getting real frustrated. And I had... I had five ADATs, three that worked, and two that were always broken. <laughs> and then I had two Mackie 1604s with the mixer mixer. If anybody, you guys are looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know what 1604s are, what's mixer mixer? But the mixer. the mixer mixer was you could join two together. Oh. And have, and have more, it would, it would join them together so you could have one right. fader and one thing for the two. Right. 16. So you had 32 track. Right. You know. And, um. And we did our demos to two inch tape, and then we'd stay and transfer them all to eight ads. And then I'd work, you know. Wow. Mixing on the little analog thing. Then I got into a, a, a Yamaha O2R digital mm -hmm. console with that. And then I went to the Task <coughs> uh, 2424, which is like a, just a better hard disk mm -hmm. thing. And then Pro Tools. And I remember talking to Gary Burnett, this real, awesome guitar session player guy and he goes I said Gary I'm thinking about getting Pro Tools and he goes Tim my grandmother's got Pro Tools <laughs> so do you, do you remember what year you switched to Pro Tools just out of curiosity no but I think I think it was at it's probably at it's probably at seven or something seven or eight yeah yeah um and I would still, for a while, I still made track sheets. 
because <laughs> I love track sheets. And someone's like, you don't need track sheets. Like, yeah. You don't need track sheets. <laughs> so, uh, but then I, I was on, then I went on the road with Amy Grant for a while. And that was great. Tommy Sims is in the band, and Dan Needham, and this incredible band. And um, I had gone to the tape room at Tree, Sony Tree, and there was this box, Buck Owens Demos. And I'd just gotten, as a gift, these Buck Owens, this Buck Owens box set. And I thought, I don't like that twangy country music. And I put, put on the CDs, and I was like, this is amazing. I was mm. so into it. So I went, and I went through the, all these cassettes, there was, they were in garbage bags. And it would just be like demos. And um, so I picked some songs and I picked some of his older released music. And I went to Tree and I said, hey, can I, can I get some money to record, re-record these Buck Owen songs in a new way? They're like, yeah, how much money do you want? I was like, $10,000? They're like, okay. <laughs> 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 So I went in and I would I did like, you know, way different versions. I did like, act naturally, but I did it real, because it's a sad song, you know. It seems goofy, but it's actually a sad lyric. And I did it like very like um, Springsteen kind of, you know, Streets of Philadelphia kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it, he was going to mow your grass. And these were like artists at the time that would have been a good fit. So like, this would be for the B-52s. And then mm -hmm. this one would, would be, you know, Sting. And then this would be... And so I did all these things, and there was a lot of interest from Sony label in New York. I started getting calls from Bakersfield at like 6.30 in the morning. I never picked up. And then Donna Hilly, the president of, of Sony Tree, called me and said, you better start answering your phone in the morning. Buck Owens is trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> and so I, I the next day I picked up, hello, and then it's Buck Owens here from Bakersfield. And I'm like, you're Bakersfield? And I said, it's 4.30 at Bakersfield. I'm an early riser. What can I say? You know, and, and uh, he said, I heard this music. He said, I think you really understand this music. And he said, I, I lost a friend 18 years ago. And I said, I know, it's, that's, that's your friend Don Rich. And he goes, yep. And then he started, got choked up. He said, I haven't recorded since then. And he said, but I got a song I want to do, and I want you to produce it. And he said, I'm going to let you, I'm going to send you money to do it two ways. One, I'm going to send you me and the Bakersfield Symphony doing it. But you would need to improve on the tune, the tuning, the timing, the tones, and the taste. <laughs> but there was, a, there was a chart. I mean, it was like full orchestra, you know, wow. winds and brass and full. And then rhythm section and do it just like that with his vocal from that day, which he sent me mm -hmm. on ADAT. And... But it was too. It was. It was too. Um, wasn't too a click. So I had to create. Yeah. A, created a click. Create a grid. And yeah. No grid because it was. We did sure, it two, yeah. two inch. And but a click. And then he said, "Then you have a version. You can do whatever you want." And I just took it out, you know. And anyway, he loved it. And he wanted me to do a record on him. And then he got tongue cancer, and they had to cut out like two thirds of his tongue. Oh, and so he couldn't sing and talk. But you know, it was. I always, it was always some kind of weird. There was always this fringy stuff, and never really like the. I always resisted like the. <laughs> better or worse. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then at that time, should you want me to keep going? Oh yeah. Anybody want to ask say anything or ask a question or anything? Oh, they'll get a chance. Well, I mean, I guess. I'm just just curious. So with Amy Grant, and some of those you were playing keys with yeah. MD. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And, but I also said, when they called for the, that gig, I said, um, um, I don't want to, I don't want to do all the synth stuff. I want to take out a world tour of Rhodes. Uh, and, and so I had like, I had some synth stuff, but I was doing a lot of stuff on Rhodes and world tour and piano and with stomp boxes. And it was, it was kind of a little different take on it. You know, they were cool with that. Um, but then um, I started getting, I would write with people at Sony who were doing sessions. Mm -hmm. And I was doing, and I started getting sessions as a musician. Mm -hmm. And so I started buying accordions and pump organs and melodicas and glockenspiels and synths and all this stuff. And I got cases to put on and I had this huge 
cartage. I'm I mean, sure. it was huge. I still have all the cases. I just don't take all that stuff, but uh, all of it at the same time. But I had, you know, half a truck of stuff, you know. And this was at a time when it was, it was really impressive to bring right. gear. Yeah. And it was kind of like, and then it was like, I was, he's the guy that has the this or the that, or you won't believe he took out this garage sale Casio and he played it through an amp and it was amazing. You know? Yeah. So I kind of got in with sort of the left center approach to that and the organic thing. But then I also was doing synths in a way that people were, I was doing it in a, in a more pop way. Well, it was, I, I was a little more modern than, mm -hmm. you know, the way that some of the synth stuff was being done in sessions. And I was the young kid, you know, so I, I did that. Um, and I started just working a ton as a, as a musician. Got it by accident, you know. But thinking, this is just like Musician Magazine. I'm here doing it. I was yeah. always the youngest guy in the sessions. And I just, I played on a variety of artists and variety of styles and with you know, these musicians that I respected and had seen on the album covers while I had a publishing deal. Um, and so I, I didn't really, I kind of decided not to tour, but I always wanted to produce, you know, and so I would get, I would, I would get, you know, I would try to develop an artist, you know, which meant you, you worked really, really hard uh, for probably no money to get screwed over. Mm -hmm. Either they, they're not screwed over, but either they, screwed over is likely, but if they might just decide they just want to go to law school. They don't want to be an artist. Or mm -hmm. they might call you and say, I have great news. So-and-so famous producer who wants to work with me. And I'm supposed to go, oh, that's fantastic. You know, and, uh, yeah. or, um, yeah, I, I had various, all kinds of various heartbreaking stories with that, you know. But, and it was mainly because nobody was hiring me to produce records you know right and yeah. I would get some sort of indie things mm -hmm. but I was always too something even the song the songwriting is too pop it's too country it's too alt it's too aggressive it's too weird it's too personal it was always too something so then somehow then you managed to get into the world of doing TV series well so I, I was at, writing at BMG by then and I was not getting any cuts, and I was frustrated about it. And I was doing plenty of sessions, so I didn't care about the, the check for the writing. Mm -hmm. And I said, can we just call it even? I've given you enough songs, you've given me enough money, even up, done. Rip it up. And they said, we can't, we can't we just, our legal affairs, we can't, we can't do that. We can't set a precedent of people deciding they want to be done with their deal, we can't. They said, but we're gonna buy you a plane ticket to London. So I and so then I went to London for a week, Berlin for a week, uh, back to back, mm -hmm. Stockholm for a week. It was gone 21 days, just week week in each. When I left, I had one writing appointment booked. I just like I show up in Stockholm, literally open the phone book to music publishers and just call up, hey, I'm from Nashville, blah blah, blah and start fill up my week. And in those three weeks, I ended. I think I got nine cuts. And I was producer on a handful of them. One of them was the winner from the Eurovision Song Contest, which is like American Idol World, which is a huge deal over there. I got a BMW commercial. I got a Revlon commercial. Um, I, I was orchestrating for this Vim Vendors film in Germany. And it was all of a sudden, they told me, nothing is wrong with your ammunition. The target is wrong. Hmm. So don't change anything. Just the ammunition is fine. Just change your target. So I went over there and I just did exactly what I was doing here, which people didn't seem too interested in. I mean, they were interested in me as a musician, but not as a writer right. or producer. Yeah. And uh, so that worked. So I started going over all the time, like 10 days a month for a few years. And I didn't really tell anybody here. I didn't know. Uh, so I would literally like come back secret. from, you know, Norway and then go straight to County Q and do a session. And what you been up to? Eh, nothing. You know, I just, I didn't want to, you know, and, but when I kind of saw the, the, you know, there were, over there, it was like, you'd, you'd get something and then it would be like in a movie trailer and he's like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it wasn't a huge hit, but, but generated some income for the movie trailer. So, huh. 
And so then I came back here and I wrote with like Katie Herzig and Matthew Perryman Jones, Manny Diaz. And we'd write like a song in that afternoon and then it would be a Target commercial. Hmm. You know, and then it'd be like, it's going to be on Grey's Anatomy. And be like, what? And it, it was like, it was, seemed so easy, you know? Mm. And I realized that my style of writing and producing that was just a little bit <laughs> turn sure <laughs> worked a lot better for a picture mm -hmm. and somehow that quirkiness and and interest and not poppiness and not scrammed in your face and not right. obvious was kind of what they were after you know yeah and so then the thing with BMG ran out and I signed with Cobalt in London and uh, then ended up doing a non-exclusive deal with them and then um, also working with Secret Road out of Los Angeles is who I work with now and just writing taking ad briefs and uh, you know scoring the picture or writing you know joke songs for the Old Spice commercial you know which I love the joke songs you know the songs that are like so terrible that they're <laughs> awesome you know they were like kind of creepy or like I love doing those <laughs> and um and I like doing the little post-score 30-second things for the Glade ad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, Angela and I wrote a, a song that was a, a big Christmas ad for Glade for four years in a row. And they flew me up to New York to record Jordan Sparks in a children's choir and gave me a budget for an orchestra and, and you know, developed some relationships with that. And, and you know, I got, got a Coke ad right after that. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. And so I kind of, I just, at that point, I, I wrote one song, I'm going back, mm -hmm. and I with a guy and I said, if this song doesn't get cut, and, or get significant interest or cut, I'm quitting writing to pitch. And we played it around, and I was like, it's kind of nice. And I said, I quit. And I, everything for the, that, I, that I had booked, every single writing appointment, which was a lot, I called and said, man, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this anymore. You can tell everybody, I'm out. My play, my game is game piece is off the table. I wanted to put it out there. I don't do this anymore. I didn't want to even keep it as a yeah thing. as an I'm, option. Just see you. Thank you and good night. And to this day, I have not written a song to pitch to a label artist. Zero interest. Okay. Just done. It's not my bag. Yeah. And I'm not interested. Yeah. And there's too many factors that yeah. it's not right for me. Right. And there's people that do it great, and I love to listen to those songs, and I'm happy for them. It's not my thing. So, um, and I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. No, no. I, that's yeah. sincerely, I'm glad yeah. people do it because I, I like listening to records. Um, and so then I remember, was it Whole Foods? And Buddy Miller was there and he was like, hey, you play accordion, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he goes, you want to come by? We're working on this TV show. It was a Sunday night. I went over like nine o'clock on a Sunday night. And I had all my cards sent over. So I had like, I don't know, six accordions and two or three pump organs. And yeah. I wanted like, this is with T-Bone, you know, and harmonicas and all this stuff. And here's Buddy Miller, who I just met in T-Bone Burnett. And I played in this one song. And I said, can you use a little piano? And they said, you play piano too? And I said, yeah. So I played some piano. And then I stayed till like two or three in the morning. I played in 13 songs. And that was Nashville. Yeah. That was the pilot. That was the stuff they were prepping for the pilot of Nashville. So I started playing on those <laughs> sessions for those guys. Uh, and then around season four, around season three, I was playing on a lot of stuff for Buddy. Season four, two. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd really love to get a shot at producing some of this stuff. And so he gave me Connie Britton. <laughs> produce gifted me yeah and which was a lot of fun and it we it was a lot of fun and and the part of it was that it, it was a challenge for her and so mm -hmm. it was a challenge for me to be with somebody who's really 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 good at something mm -hmm. to be doing something that is not in her wheelhouse right. and she knows it yeah and I think, when I just said this right now, I just identified, who did, here does Enneagram? Okay, who, okay. So as a three, 
the most, everybody should, uh, we'll talk about Enneagram in a second. <laughs> but the most uncomfortable thing for me is to do something that I'm not so good at. Mm. Uh, you, I will never wallpaper. I will never try to fix a toilet. I will never try to fix a car. I will, because there are people who are so good at that. I can't wait to drive my car to them and have them tell me what's going on. You do you, I'll do me. You want a piano part? Come on over. I will dominate. And you dominate my car right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, th- so I, saying that, I yeah. really identified mm. because I think she's a great actor. And I know she's a great actor. And I, could, it, I felt her pain mm. of going, yeah. I'm, I'm so experienced. I'm so good. I'm successful. I'm loved. I've proven myself. Yeah. And yet it'd be like me having to play a tap dancer. Right. You know what I mean? It's like it ain't gonna happen, you right. know. Yeah. But I would do all I could and still just be like, oh. so um, Connie, and then they can't stuff came out great. And then I got the new cast members. Um, if people come in for like two songs and something like that, right. buddy. And then we were, were in the studio one time at Russell Zeker, who was head of TV at Lionsgate, who was there, and. We were doing something for a funeral, and we were playing, um, I don't know, some gospel song. And I kind of played it up, you know, like churchy, black gospel, because that's what I, oh, I forgot that whole thing. Yeah. I was at Belmont, and there was a sign. <laughs> it said, musicians needed, remuneration will be provided. And I went back to my room, and I looked up remuneration. And I found out that remuneration meant pay. And so I went and I Just called this guy, something. Thomas B. New, okay. Tommy New, and I said, I'll meet you after chapel. And I said, how will I know you? He said, you'll know me. And he was wearing yellow shoes, canary yellow pants, yellow shirt, yellow vest, and a yellow Kangol cap. And we went down and, and I, we started playing. I was reading this stuff and he's like, no, you got to fix it up. And he said, move over. And so he gave me all these sets, Mississippi Mass Choir, Florida Mass Choir, all this gospel stuff. And I would just sit there and listen to it and figure out. And so I did that for four years, okay. playing all. It was the Sunday School Publishing Board Choir. So the, 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 it was a work choir. So it wasn't just a church. I also mm-hmm. had a church, too. And I need some help from the boy on the organ. And, you know, and I'd go run up there, you know, figure, figure out what key he was in, you know, the handkerchief over the, over the mic and the whole thing, and just hanging out for dear life. It was amazing. It was great. So, so we did... Um, this, you know, kind of like cliche gospel funeral song. Okay. With the token half black character, you know. She, give her that gospel song, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> we're doing that. And um, I fixed it up as a joke, you know. Yeah. And so Russell on the break said, hey, um, I've got this show called Greenleaf. It's Lionsgate. And, you know... Uh, I need somebody to kind of do what Buddy's doing for this show. It's basically like Nashville. It's around music. We got all these people, except instead of being in Nashville and being in country music, it's in Memphis and it's the black church. I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I said, I can certainly hook you up with these people. So I gave him a bunch of names of people that I knew. And he said, do you want to, do you want to like kind of spearhead this? I said, great. Well, that didn't work out. There was, it was, it was an Oprah show. She got one of her friends Talented, talented friend to work on the show. But there were some issues with following directions, meeting budget, meeting Mm -hmm. deadline, which had nothing to do with talent, ability, resume. It just was not a good, you know, TV is a team sport, Mm -hmm. you know. And it required some very specific delivery and very, you know, collaborative and certain ways you have to record things. So when you look at it on the screen, it looks it doesn't look like you're playing to a record, but you believe that these people are in the room. Mm-hmm. Some issues like that, and it wasn't going so hot. So they asked me to come back and work on the show. I ended up writing the, the main title for the show, and they got Mavis Staples to sing it. Mm. It's incredible. Went up to, to Chicago on Martin Luther King Day with Mavis Staples. It was unbelievable, like one of the best moments of my life. Yeah. And um, she, we were leaving, and she was leaving, and I said, it's been an honor to be with you, especially in this day. And she said, I could tell you stories about Dr. King. 
And I said, I sure wish you would. And she said, well, I'm hungry. And I said, well, let's go order lunch. <laughs> so we ordered some lunch, and she sat for another couple hours and oh, told man. Bob Dylan stories and Dr. King stories and stories of her family and Pop Staples, who's one of my favorite guitar players of all time. And so that was incredible. Wow. And I got to work with her another time, too. So it was that was great. So I did Greenleaf, and I loved it. Just loved it. Only 13 episodes. And it about killed me. I mean, I thought, whoa, this is a lot of work. And we had accompanying soundtrack, and it just kind of took over my life. And my kids were like, Dad, we never see you, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, working over Christmas break. But I did it. I really wanted to do season two. And then uh, I got the call that Buddy doesn't want to do Nashville. I said, oh, he'll do it. He just needs a break. I want to do Greenleaf. And I want to work for Buddy. Buddy does Nashville. They're like, I don't think it's going to go down like that. So they said, if you want to show, you should do take Nashville. And I, and I kind of thought, man, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that kind of music. And, then, uh, so. and so I just I had my interview with Marshall Herskovitz and Ed Zwick, who are you know, Hollywood legend, producer, director, writer guys. And I just said, hey, you know, T-Bone is a brand. Buddy's a brand. You know, they, you can talk about them in press and people will be like, whoa, hey, that's cool. You know, I said, I'm just, my brand is not late, not over budget, no complaining, no drama, cheerful revisions. Um, and I think that the music should be very, should be varied. We should represent everything that's happening in Nashville. Mm. At some point, every kind of music that's going on, you know, pure bluegrass, um, gospel music, pop music, country music, um, you know, whatever. Yeah. And they said, okay, well, we gotta talk to some other people. We'll call you back. Call back 20 minutes later, and like, you want this job? So that's what I've been, so I'm, I'm finishing right now. Tomorrow, I'll, I've got about a half a day. Uh, tomorrow will probably be my last day finishing up the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. That was my very last thing of the show. Wow. So I've had three seasons now of TV and, and I love it. But all that, you know, everything, and this has been easily the biggest, the highest profile and biggest workload, most creative freedom, most responsibility, you know, the best remuneration, um, you know, everything. <laughs> This is like, whoa, this is, in every level, is like, okay, this is a different yeah. an animal. I mean, I'm used to working for people, and now I have a music department, and I'm used to have people, like, approving things, and now, you know, I can say, this is the mix, you know? So, um, at least for the for soundtrack or whatever, but um, I can look back and I can see, oh, I got to write strings. I got to write strings with the montage and do my little kind of scoring thing, you know? Yeah. And I get to produce singers who are trying to figure out how to, how to find their voice. And that's what I was doing in college in all those rooms, yeah. you know? And I get to play a little bass and I get to play a little guitar and I get to play little drums and I get to cast musicians just like Quincy Jones got to cast musicians per song. And I had the budget to do whoever I wanted in whatever studio I wanted wow. and take the, as much time as I wanted, you know, and um, uh, I got to write, you know, I wrote songs and I got to write to brief and I got to write to script and um, I got to, I'd seen enough crazy artists that I wasn't surprised by crazy <laughs> actors, you know? Yeah. It was just like, it's not crazy, it's just it's just part of the drill, you yeah. know? And so I could handle the, the phone calls and the, you know, when things got, you know, personal or emotional or, yeah. or dodgy or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, I got to mix a bunch of stuff. And so now all of a sudden I get all these things and I got to, you know, we got to do some gospel music that was directly related to the church stuff that I had done here. And I got to use some of the young programmers that had kind of come up under me, helping me out of my studio for, for as first as an intern, and then 10 bucks an hour, and then 15 bucks an hour, and then 20 bucks an hour, you know? Yeah. And I got to say, hey man, I want to pay you some legit money to work on this thing. And um, <clears throat> So it's been really fun to, yeah. to, to do TV and then, um, doing so much music that 
uh, I was really proud of and nobody heard. You know, I remember saying in my t mid, late 20s, like, I don't care if anybody hears his music. I can take this dat <laughs> and throw it in the Cumberland River and not even care. Um, meaning like, like the reward was the doing, you mm. know. And then you get to a certain po point in life, you're like, it should be nice if somebody heard this, you know. <laughs> so it's very satisfying to do something where you go, wow, there's a lot of people that hear that Greenleaf theme and like, all right, here's my show. Yeah. You know, get the popcorn. You know, what's happening this week, you know. And same thing with Nashville. where like, there's, you know, like uber fans that are like obsessed with, you know, Avery's new song or whatever, right. you know. And, right. People buying it, you know, on iTunes and listening, soccer moms listening, you know, gearing up for tonight's episode, and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's fun, yeah. Um, and also doing it all outside of the context of that artist record label mm. thing that I had said, eh, I'm not into that anymore. Man. And able to do something on a big scale yeah. without that. Yeah, it's been, it's been really great. That's amazing. That's so very full circle. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, why don't we push pause? Let's push pause, and we'll come back and let the good people ask ask you lots of questions. Music City listeners is brought to you by Forty One Fifteen, the East Nashville recording studio dedicated to serving up home style recordings since twenty twelve, and Music City Content Kings a creative photo and video production company that believes in transparency and value. Good to go, serving up the goodness from our favorite food truck and catering events for people who have good taste. And Handmade Productions, a couple of wildly talented dudes making all things music and video. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is, uh, I, like I told you, this is kind of open Q&A, except for whatever you decide you don't want to answer. So. Yeah. Also, if there aren't any questions, then we can just have a nice time. And What's your biggest it. fear? <laughs> what, of being a failure. Yeah. I mean, that's the uh, yeah. that's to the Enneagram, you know. I'm serious about the Enneagram. Um, that has been super, super helpful for me and my family. Um, it's really helpful for me, like with the guys helping me at my studio. Um, it's helped. I think about that when I'm casting an engineer, I'm thinking <clears throat> casting uh, on how I re how I. If I've got a six, I'm just lavishing compliments all day. I'm not a big smoke blower, and I'm not a big compliment giver unless I really mean it. But I'm willing to do it for that person because that's their that's their they're worried and that's their fuel. So fine, it's great, you know. Um, and you know if, if, if it's a you know if, if it's if it's a three I know they they love a to do list gets gets getting stuff done you know and you know if it's a two I gotta make sure I don't hurt their feelings and you know and you know if it's a, if it's a four engineer and it's and 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 who knows about the enneagram okay so so you know if you got a four and this mix has to be a really safe pop mix I'm just not gonna give it to them. Because they want to express themselves, and they, if it needs to be a super clean recording, you know, that just sounds super natural, they're gonna hate doing it because mm -hmm. they want to express themselves, they want to be impressionistic about. It. So it's a way to go. But if you got a five engineer, they might just love, you know, or or one, you know. So you kind of, I can kind of think, I know what these people's um, <clears throat> uh, core fear is and their motivation and. And so that, but when you, as soon as you answered that, before I could, you know, I went uh, to, with a friend to his 50th birthday in New York, and he brought up a group of guys up there, and we had a blast. And we went to this uh, this show, this Broadway show called In and of Itself, which is sort of a magic show. I mean, it's mind blowing, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. You're shaking your head, do you know about this? Okay, it's one of the coolest things. <laughs> uh, but you, there's just, there's, just, there's like all these tags. And it says, I am. And it's like, I am a dog lover. I am 
a um, <clears throat> ventriloquist. I am a teacher. I'm a mother. I'm a friend. I'm a creator. I'm a, and I'm looking at it. And I said, I am a failure. I was like, I found mine. <laughs> and it was really, it was, it, like, so the whole show was designed to make you think about who your identity and on, how you perceive other people. But it was really, and I refused to take it because I knew that, I knew it wasn't true, but it was also profound for me. I mean, this was this November that I, that I was looking for the one that I resonated with. And when I saw I'm a failure, I was like, I'm home. That's my people. And so that's always, that's, that's my, that's my, it's terrible, you know, but it's just true. I'm just being honest, you know, and I feel like a, a failure, you know, and so I'm always trying to balance either not feeling like a failure or doing something that makes me feel like an achiever for five minutes, you know, so that's, that's just my honest confession, you know, and part of that is, has been a, a you know, a motivating engine to to what I do, and and part of it's just has been the the struggle part of it. You know, so does that make any sense? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I'm glad you set the tone for the kind of questions <laughs> we can ask here. But really, like that's, yeah. yeah. But I don't mind answering gear questions either. So. <laughs> So I want to ask just like a few rapid fire ones, yeah. just to understand your skill set. So you're a songwriter, you're a great on keys, you're a arranger, a producer. Are you also a good engineer and mixer? I, uh, yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the answer, no, the answer is yes, yeah. Yeah. and and um, I know that because. I know how to make stuff sound the way that I want it to sound. Now, because it's really, okay, this is um, anthropological, uh, um, <clears throat> sociological. Um, I think that the people that elevate in any society are specialists, right? So, um, you know, the person who, the only person in town that can uh, shoe a horse becomes very valuable. You know, there's the sharpshooter in the tribe. You know, um, the, the, the wise old shaman, whatever it is, you know. And in, if you look around our, our society, people who are really good at something, nobody says... Steph Curry's an amazing basketball player, but have you tasted his cooking? Like, we don't ask him to be anything else. Sure. Like, that's enough. Right. Nobody even really kind of says, is he a good dad? Do mm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, hey, hey, there's a game on right now. You know, which there is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, um, so... Okay, if you so then you think about um, the people that are elevated, or sports heroes, who are like that. That person is really good at throwing a ball really fast at that batter, you know, or they're really good at basketball. The, actors like the things that are like different, like you're a, like not a lot of people can do. And if you look about it in this tiny bit of our music business, um, who would specialists be? Not just a session player. Not the, the star session players are not the ones who you can throw anything at them and they can do it all. They're the ones who have a thing. The ones who really get the magazine, the articles, and are elevated, they're the ones that, like, they just kind of have their thing, and they just like, you want them? They come in and do the thing. And they just do their thing in that song, they do their thing in that song, they do their thing in that song. You know? Now, you, mm -hmm. the, the working, the long throw working musician is likely to have a very diverse skill set, right? Um, you know, I have a very diverse skill set, and not only is it diverse in this town, but I get a good percentage of my income from other towns and other countries and territories of the world. And it's been like that for a while. So, and cross-genre, you know? So, you know, 
I could, I might be doing a lot of Christian music, but then I'm also playing accordion for Emil Harris, you know, and then I'm playing on, on the, you know, the, and these are all true things, and then the same day I might be playing for the Alice Cooper Garage Band thing, you know, and, and then doing, a, you know, um, Applebee's commercial, you know. So that diversity has floated my boat and put food in, on my table for, for my family. But it's the star, the, the engineer. He's an engineer. No, it's the mix engineer. It's the, the specialist that's brought in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I know about myself that I, um, w which is why the Nashville gig was a really great gig for me in YTV in general. Because then I can be the specialist, and my specialty is making sure that this works that nothing falls through the cracks. Yeah. So I have to know if they send me a picture of a microphone for a scene, like they would never be using this at a county fair in Ohio because there's dust, you know what I mean? Right. Or, what, or, you know, we need to have a console. What do you think of this one? I'm like, no, that's a live console. You need the studio console would be this. And, and it would be out of the price range for this indie kid in the in this bedroom on the east side. So you know, so then I know about this, and then and then well, we need to get a voice coach for so and so. I was like, I know that that's not going to fit because so then all of a sudden, I'm I'm the filter because I know a bunch of things, which is why I just found this job is like oh, I got I got but. Um, be you know a diversity can can float your belt for a long time. But if you can hack it, which I cannot, I'll write strings and I'll think, there is nothing I enjoy more in this world than writing strings. And then by two o'clock, I'm just like, man, I love to play a piano part. <laughs> you know? And then I get on a session, I'm so happy to be there. And by the, literally, the first half hour, I'm just like, oh dear God, get me out of here. I want to go score an ad. You, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not kidding. Like, it's so fun after the first quarter of a bagel. And then by the time we're working, I'm just like, I cannot believe I'm three hours of my life are gonna go by doing this. You know, so <laughs> the only way for me to, 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 to thrive, this is just me, you know, uh, mentally and emotionally is to have the variety. I'm not recommending that to everybody if you want to, you know, be a, a star in this business. Don't work on your weaknesses. Just work on your strengths, because someone's always going to beat you on your weaknesses. If you want to be the, if you want to be the specialist, laser beam star. And these are all just my theories. That could be wrong. So, uh, when you produce a song, like how important do you feel like it is to mix it after that, or like at what point in the process do you like, take your hands off and realize that you've done what you can do? Sort of like. As a specialist, like you're saying. Me for, I, I, for me to mix it? Or like, whatever you've done on a song, like at what point do you feel yeah. like it's not yours anymore? Like, it's not necessarily not yours, but not your turn. Well, I think, no, that's a very good question. And um, I think that, you know, I think that I have a, a taste level and I'm realistic enough about my own abilities and experience and um, wheelhouse. And I have a taste, and I have enough humility and fear of failure and able to recognize a good casting decision that I can say, I can tell you what, I am not the guy for this. And I usually know before the song's recorded. You know what I mean? If something is very arrangement oriented and a lot of stuff I produce is, is like orchestration if you think about the way a score orchestra score looks right it's all these lines here's all these strings here's all this look think of a, of a Pro Tools session here's my drums here's my bass here's my guitar here's my keyboard here's my vocal and get these lanes so if I'm looking at a, at, at a Pro Tools screen and I see these waveforms that looks very much to me like a score these instruments, so I can say, oh, they play here, they play here. And then my, my um, I'm not a great player, you know. I, pl I play parts, you know, I don't play fast. I got no chops, you know. But but I people hire me because I play a part. No, I don't play anything hard, you know. 
it's just it's just it's just right it's correct it's for the song you know so a lot of my um, productions for very much rely on the role that certain instruments play and somebody if they don't get the role that certain instruments play the whole thing comes undone at least according to my vision and then sometimes if you're working we you don't have a budget you're developing an artist or by doing your own demos if you can get 80% of the way there save your money mix it yourself just get better you, you know what's the biggest obstacle that you encounter I guess day to day and what would you do and how do you overcome that? well like right now I mean, right now, I'm trying to figure out my next phase. I'm in a, I'm in a new f f phase, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the obstacle for me would be just being committed to not getting pulled comfortably back into <clears throat> something I've already done. Um, this speaks to the specialist kind of thing. If I would just hunker down and just get better and better and better and better, more dialed in at something, you know, that might be really good for the client. Um, but I always want to feel like I'm in over my head. <laughs> so I always want to feel like this is impossible. I can't do this. This is going to be terrible. Why did they trust me in this? I should not be in this session. I should not have this job. This is too hard for me. The deadline is too soon. I don't have enough budget. That's where I thrive. Uh, oh, pressure, and it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, nothing better than, you know, this 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 uh, commercial was due at 1 o'clock, and it's 12.30, and I still got to play two parts and mix it and upload it. I'm like, this is so exciting. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so that, but the obstacle for me, and then the other obstacles just, it's like I'm also, I haven't done it long enough, then I'm realistic enough to know how hard it is. So I can get real excited about my new idea, like a business idea or a business model or, or thing I'm gonna pursue. And I can have like this like youthful enthusiasm and commitment to it. But I'm old enough and I'm smart enough to, to go, if somebody else told me this was their plan, I'd be like, good luck. <laughs> ain't gonna happen, you know? So I have to balance, um, you know, being passionate and also the other side of me that, that can shoot most things out of the air is terrible ideas. Because it's really, really hard to just to make a living in the music business right now. Which is why I'm kind of out of it. I'm, I'm in the TV and movie business I want to be. Advertising music, I'm, I don't want to be in the music business. I want to make music for the television, film, and advertising business. Have you worked on? None. Oh, none? <laughs> no, I mean, I've scored, not scored, I've uh, orchestrated for some um, German films um, and some cool ones, you know. This guy, Ben Benders, is a very respected director. And, um, you know, I've done some end title stuff. And, but I haven't. I haven't. That's what's exciting. It's like I've got a 10 year plan. I'm, just, I'm like the kid that showed up in Nashville that wants to. <laughs> Be an artist and wants to be a session player and he got what kind of resume? Zero. <laughs> you know? So I mean my my ten year plan is to scoring. You know, I'm not gonna be old. I'm almost fifty, and I won't be old at almost sixty for scoring. You know? <laughs> I'll be too old to like produce cool, you know, people on the east side, you know, but or not. But that's not what I'm what, what I want to do. I mean, so um, that's you know, I, that's the case in point. It's like you're really going to do something totally different now. He's <laughs> refreshing. Yeah. And I think the other challenge is balancing um, balancing time and priorities. How much, you know, um, like you say, if you're like right now when I finish the show, which which is like job and this is this is 
there's, it has an end, it's a bookend, you know? And when you have deadlines and you have, like, this is what it pays, this is what it has to be done, this is what has to be done. Now I'm back to, I'm making music that I'm gonna pitch to film and TV. Like, this is not scoring stuff, but this is like making music that I'll pitch to television shows or, or post scoring ads or what, you know what I mean? Um, I could work 20 hours a day and make more music, which would up my chances for landing stuff. Or I could be done at six. And it's figuring out which one I'm gonna choose, what's wiser, you know. Because I've spent three years not being home for dinner. So it's gonna be a challenge for me to, you know, like be okay with not being home for dinner and then doing a bunch of stuff on my laptop. Like, like it's okay to just be done working. It's, it's unthinkable at this point because I've been in it for so long to like at five be done for the day. I, I just, that just makes me, feels lazy. I remember we were, we were working on the show and at eight o'clock one night, <clears throat> I think she got started getting phone calls about 7.45 in the morning. About eight one night, I was like, man, I just, I don't, I'm, I'm, I feel like packing it in. I feel like being done for the day. And I remember driving home feeling really guilty, like I was a lazy sluggard, you know? <laughs> that I only put in 12 hours that day. And that's not healthy, that's not good, that's not right. That doesn't, that doesn't lead to a long-term long um, satisfaction if you're living in a community like a family, for instance, <laughs> you know? So you've referenced uh, vocal production a couple times. First time was whenever you were uh, accompanying lessons and you were being around different vocal coaches. Um, do you have any uh, wise words for producing vocals or uh, the difference between producing a male vocal versus a female vocal? Or? The best, I think the best advice that I can get is learn to be a student of the person that gauging, you know, is this person come out of the blocks giving, if they come and give you their best performances right away, you better have those levels set, you better have a mood ready, you better do it at the time of day that's best for them, do it when they're in a good mood, and then don't make them do take 22, you know, and be, tr trust that we probably got some good stuff right at the beginning. If if there's somebody who needs, you know, who, who has a lot of self-doubt, you might not want to say, this is not going to consistently under. You know, like, oh, crap, I'm flat. You know, uh, you might want to say something like, you're doing awesome. I can't believe how well you're singing. <laughs> because then they're going to think... <laughs> I'm singing well, and then they're gonna go. I can do this, you know. And then, then they might tune up, you know. So, um, it, I think it's it's you know it's it's knowing like, uh, you know, I'll, I like to take a lyric sheet and and just kind of just let it unfold, and have a little system, you know, like pitch, tone, timing. So P, P for pocket, you know, and. Um, you know, you know, little things that I'll stick on there and underlining the things that I don't have. If they have annoying vibrato, I'll, I'll, I'll write a squiggly over the places where they're... And then I just, you know, I, then I'm waiting for the one when they don't. And it's like, thank God. And then I'll, that's number seven. And then I'm just trying, I'm kind of seeing, can I put this together later? And that's just the responsible, just nuts and bolts of it. But then there's another thing of like, waiting till I feel something. Not like, was that in time, was that in time, but when did I, what is, whenever I start listening to the, really listening to the vocal and, and listening instead of analyzing, you know, instead of judging, I'm drawn in. Now we're on to something, you know? And also, you know, knowing the lyric, you know, asking somebody, Hey, um, are you saying this to yourself in a journal? Are you saying this 
at a lectern to people you know? Are you saying it to people you don't know? Are you saying it late at night with candlelight and a glass of wine to a good friend? Um, is, somebody, is this something you need someone to say to you? You know, and you sort of dig in that way where you get the intent and the, the point of view, which is, a, a, which is really going to help with a meaningful performance. Do you ever, uh, sorry, it's a two-parter. Uh, but, but in addition to yeah, that, yeah, yeah. in addition to that, just a lot of the little things of like, you know, watching like, like, hey, maybe you should stand up and, and you know, and, and dance more, you know, and, and you know, you should maybe bridge your shoulders up or, you know, you looking for, the mic's too high and no wonder it sounds pinched, you know. <clears throat> and then, if, you know, like, just like, you know, if, if they're singing I and there's no air on it, well, try to, like, sing hi, and that gets the air conditioning going, you know. And just all those little things where you help somebody to, you know, open their mind, maybe instead of saying, um, that they're that they're sharp. I'll say drop your jaw on this word, and nine times out of ten they drop their jaw and it tunes up, you know. Or if they're flat, I'll say smile. I'll just widen. Put your shoulders back and widen widen your smile a little bit, you know. And then it's like oh, now it's in tune, you know. And so that was the second part, which it sounds like you would say no to this next question, but it was going to be do you bring in vocal coaches sometimes to translate what I'm not a vocal producer a vocal coach and so yeah. sometimes I feel like it's hard to translate what I want into language that they can actually execute it, especially you know, like and I'm thinking yeah coaches? I'm thinking of the show yeah. too which was there were situations where I needed to be bad cop mm -hmm. they were already mad because they wanted to yeah. go visit their boyfriend in LA and I said you gotta get the vocal and they don't like the song. They don't like their character arc of the show. Don't want to be there. You know what I mean? Don't want to sing, period. And, you know, and so I'm just thinking, I just got to get on my sheet and start finding. And I'm saying, giving them so many notes and so many things. And I'm having such a hard time with the Mr. Positive because there's not much to grab onto. You know, uh, I there were I would get a, 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 a vocal coach that would be more mechanics, and I would know exactly what I could say, but because they had a relationship with this vocal coach, I could say, just help them with those long O's. Just kind of shut down the long O's, you know. And they say, hey, when we get to the, you know, and then it's not I'm not ganging up on everything. Yeah. I'm not ganging up on taste tone time, you know. And it's like. I don't know. Maybe we could. Hey, Valerie, you got any ideas for how to, you know? And then, <clears throat> you know, and then um, also, then that's then there's the performance coach. So I also hired a guy that would, I would just say, go to her house, go to his house, practice, because, you know, some people want to just shoot from the hip, and like when I'm doing sessions, I don't like to know the songs. I don't even want to hear the song before I go and record. Like if someone gives me a chart and says, "Let me play for the song," I'm like, please don't. Just put me in record, because I want to respond right then, you know. But some people are going to ramp up into it. It's not that they're worse or better. It's just they're different, you know. I get a super competitive, determined thing where I want to blow their minds on my first take. We're like, whoa. You know, some of these singers, just that they come in and the reason they, 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 like the difference in a studio drummer and a live drummer who are both great drummers is a live drummer will play really tight and really great after he or she knows what part they're gonna play. A session drummer comes in, and it could be the wrong snare drum, wrong groove, wrong part, wrong everything, but it's gonna feel really great. Um, so <laughs> this is what I'm saying about people, some people can't land something in any part of the song convincingly because they just don't know it well enough. So it's like, maybe instead of learning the song together, you come in really knowing it. So I'd send somebody over to practice with them. And then sometimes put them out by the mic. It's like the hype man, you know? And so I'm here taking my little sheet. I got a vocal, vocal coach that's on mechanics. Like you can get a little more air around that tone if you would blah, blah, blah. And remember that thing we practiced, a little glottal thing to start the things that you get so you get, you know? 
And then I got a hype man out here, you know. Yes. <laughs> you know, and then, and then oh, girlfriend. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's like these headphones sound terrible. It's like, oh, yeah, they, 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 they don't know how to get a good headphone sound here. You know, you know, you know and it's like, right? And so you just, right? And then it's like, great. But it sounds great. It sounds great, Sorry. but you know, so it's it's you know just saying, look, whatever we need to do to to make this happen, you know. Wow. So so there, there's two parts. One is the the performance part, and just the booing of the, and then there's the mechanics. And it sometimes it's the personality isn't quite right. Then you need both, <laughs> which costs money. You know, you can't do all the time. kind of segued into it talking about um, how you don't want to hear the song before you go to work on it. And I was just wondering, especially with your ambition for scoring and things like that in the future, I'm wondering how you, do you find yourself stockpiling ideas in less than just holding them upstairs? Or are you waiting for the inspiration of the job to say, you know, not oh, really. wow, this is like, I've been thinking about this. Or is the job saying, oh, I know exactly what this needs, but I've never thought of it before. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. And I, as a, when I was writing more songs, I probably had a, a pad somewhere where I had song titles, and I probably didn't use many of them, because in songwriting, I always like to start just talking, and then somebody will say something, and I'm like, I like that, and then it's a personal somewhere. So other people are different, you know. They come in with the song started. I don't have any. Not one single thing like that. Here's an idea for a groove, and here's a motif, and here's absolutely zero. Any strings? <laughs> I don't have any any kind of like things waiting around. Sure. I don't mind repurposing things. Like, for instance, if you put music up for an ad, and they don't use it, then I still own it. Nobody's use it, and then something else comes along. It's a similar vibe. Maybe I can take. Four elements: stick the bass and the and the pizzicato cello and the shaker and and start with that, you know, and chop that bar out and copy that, you know. So I might start with something I already did, but I don't have things just waiting for the opportunity. Yeah, that lends itself. I don't think that's a bad idea. It's just not how I work. It's, it's like an easy thing now. So I wonder, like, how many people who are actively working in the field are kind of using these simple tools to just be like, oh, this is great, and it's not so much coming it into your phone anymore as you can be like... Yeah, I think that's yeah. fine, especially if you can some, find some way to name it and come back to it. Um, but I like the pressure of like having, doing it like for this moment. When I, you know, when I was doing a lot more sessions, I never saved any, any like I would never make a sound and then go, oh, this is nice, I think I'll save it. Ever, 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 ever. Um, I don't have any mixed templates. Never have. I don't have any anything that I bring in to start. I don't have a song start template. It's just, just me. I just I just kind of like to have a blank slate every time. Um, you got some some very big names on your discography. Are they mostly keys credits? Mm-hmm. You, you got any good stories? I mean, you got Taylor Swift, Shawn Mendes, uh, Civil Wars. Lady Yes, great, amazing name. Any, any good? Yeah, I mean, it's all, share? it's all, you know, the Taylor Swift stuff was really, really, we did it really fast. It was overdubbing. Uh -huh. So I remember one time I had a, it was a six o'clock session. I got there, you know, a little bit early. Nathan Chapman was producing. Uh, they had a chart. I said, play me half of the intro. Great, got it. Went out there. <laughs> played it down Sorry. Nathan, Nathan walked in while I was finishing he listened he said let me hear it he listened down he goes I'm great with that and I said can I give you another pass and he goes sure so played another pass he goes I like the first one and I left and my wife had said are you going to be home for dinner and I said no and she said okay and I got home at like 6.15 and she said I thought you had a session I said I'm done you know so a lot of that was very you know um, I played on an Andrew Rip record and I did all eleven songs in two and a half hours. No, no, no. It was, it was, it was. Wait a second. 
it was 90 minutes that I played all 11 songs. And they had the songs in order, and it was all organ. It was Charlie Piquet, so we put an organ on every song. Cool. And they would just pull up the thing, and I'd go, great. <laughs> next thing, we had to chat, had to sip a coffee, go out the lower, one thing next, boom. And so it was either one or two passes on, on all the songs, you know. That's so great. Um, you did like a real Hammond or? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, but, but uh, you know, like Civil War stuff, that was a lot more detailed. That was totally different. That wasn't like, let's just blow over the top of this. It was like, okay, we want this to sound like a piano and guitar and, and two voices. And I would just like really do detailed work. Like, what if I would just hit, you know, like with the Celeste with no attack on just these top notes to bring out this guitar part? And what if I would just double the bottom string all the way through with like a subharmonic thing so it just makes it like a big guitar? You know, really detailed, like surgical things. And then it would just be like one decibel above audible. Like, but then you, you mute it, you're like, Huh, sounds kind of dead. You know, so really super, like, really intense. And it take a lot of passes to try to land stuff right. And, and I don't mind doing that either. I mean, it's, it's not like there's anything, like, to be proud of or, like, you know, not, not trying hard or trying passes. But it, if I'm overdubbing, they have the tempo, they have the form. They have the track. They have most everything they need. So I'm just trying to go, what are we missing? And I'll tell them, what you, we just need some sparkly up top. Great. You know, or just, it just needs to grind. Like, it just needs more beef. Okay, so just here's a side of beef coming up, you know. That's great. Um. So you do, you do a lot of work for sync, and I was curious if you, there seems to be a lot of resources for songwriters who are fishing to artists, like writers rounds and songwriters, and writing camps and stuff like that. Um, do you know any resources for people who are trying to meet either music supervisors or uh, people who work at licensing companies or Yeah, well they have, like they, they have some of these licensing uh, music supervisor things around town and in LA, and other places, where you, you can either submit songs, and I forget the names of them, but they have them, you know, probably four times a year. You either submit songs and they pick you, and then they have like a performance and all the supervisors are there. And then, the, or you can pay to be part of a showcase. The supervisor thing, I think it's great to get to know music supervisors. Um, you know, if you had a couple that you clicked with, um, that'd be a really valuable thing. Uh, I think you don't want to wear them out. You know, like you don't want to say, hey, you know, I think this would be great for your show Nashville. And they're like, it's actually off the air. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, or you don't want to be like, this would be great for your song, your show Nashville. And you're like, for which character? Like, like the red haired girl? She got killed by a car, you know? <laughs> yeah, or it's, you know what I mean? It's like the, it's like, it's like, like not, it's like, <laughs> I don't think you'd want to wear out a supervisor. I think you might, if you found yourself consistently getting results with the supervisor that you felt comfortable with, you could say something like, hey, keep me in mind, I'm way up for, if you are, I'm really up for, for writing to brief to help, to help you out when you need stuff. And if, if you like doing that. And then maybe you can be on that person's list as a go-to where they're thinking of you. And back to the specializing, this is just what I think. I think that that supervisor is going to think of you as a certain person. He does my emotional, heartbreaking love balance. And you keep, and you keep saying, I know, but I got this really hard-hitting action, you know, instrumental cue like you do. And they're like, no, 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 you're the love bell guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's not many people that hire me to do more than one thing. Does that make sense? When did that get established? From the beginning. Yeah. 
you know. The very first thing that you did. They hired they hired they hired me twice a year to play Bob Dylan harmonica. Mm -hmm. That's it. But you know, I'll do taxes and have sixty employers. Literally, you know. And this person thinks of me as boy. If you want someone to play piano like a singer songwriter. If you want Brian Eno kind of synths, this, this is the guy for that. But if you want just really cool pop string charts, boom, you know. So there's not many people that that say, man, Tim does it all, you know. They're like, I'm their secret weapon for this niche. And then the problem is, the, the cool thing is, you're their secret weapon for this niche. you got to fill a lot of niches <laughs> to make a trip to Kroger. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what I'm saying and I think it's the same way uh, with the sync and licensing which I think is why people a lot of times have their band names like you know I'm you know the Dewey Decimal System for this <laughs> you know and then I'm seven the, different sizes yeah and then I then I have this and then I have the swing Bears band called, always involved. called the Dew Drops you know and then I you know there's always you know <laughs> And then there, we have this duo called Boyd and Girl, and and you, <laughs> and you know, so, and then you, and then you like so then you can like take on that persona mm. instead of telling people like oh I I don't just do this they don't ever want to hear that you know don't have a business card that says Tim Lauer accordion piano uh, guitar bass arranging mixing songwriting I would never in a million years do that ever. Because then they're just like, you can't possibly be good. <laughs> you know, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm not so great at some of it. I could, but I I could find a thing. You know what I mean? I wouldn't yeah. be the guy for every opportunity on some of those tasks. But so I, I wouldn't try. I don't try to sell myself as that. Tim Lauer, a guy who does well under pressure. That. Mm. I, I could go with that. Which you really well Yeah, I mean, last minute, you know, I always. So what do you, what do you guys, like, what, what is your, like, thing you lay awake in bed wondering how to crack? Do you want a job job or do you want lots of jobs? I don't know, something that'll give me money. I prefer to, that I like to do. Hmm? There's lots of things that I do. I think, um, back to the Enneagram, talking about like why we do stuff, I think it's okay and helpful to be really honest about what you want and not feel guilty about it. Like I heard someone say, man, the thing about him is just like, I just feel like he just, he's just like doing it for the money. Like it was a bad thing. And it's like, he was a guitar player. And I thought, what if somebody had a hardwood flooring business and they say, man, that guy's really great at floors, but I think he's just doing it for the money. <laughs> you just laughed, but you had yeah. a concerned look on your face when I told you about the musician that did it for the money. True. Mm. It was it was kind of like mm. so. Um, it's okay sometimes to say what do I what do I need most right now? Is I just want to make some freaking money. Bring it on, you know. And here's this terrible singer who's a trust fund kid, whose dad's got a private jet, and the music is the worst, and they want you so bad. And you name your price, you jack it up, because this gig sucks. <laughs> and you say, this is how much it costs. And they say, fine. And you go, great. You're doing it for the money. Don't feel guilty about it. Some people do hardwood floors for terrible, awful people who have no taste and pick a color that they don't like. It's a job. And then you say, boy, this is killing my soul. I need to do something that just that just feeds my my 
creative juices where I can really feel like I'm being me, you know, and then do it, do it. But don't sit around and cry when it's not making any money. Because if you want to make money, you got to look at what else is making money. Uh, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you say, you know, I want to be an artist, but I don't want anyone telling me what to wear and how to cut my hair and what picture to use and what songs to record and what, who to use for a band. Don't get a record deal. You can do that. You can do that. Go find a job and then go on the weekends with your band. Find a really good paying job so you can go out and play music and nobody tells you what to do. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being absolutely honest. You know, if you don't want to take direction, if you don't want to work for others, and if you're not willing to work on a lot of music that you would never listen to, get out of this business and do it for the love of it. Because this is a service industry where you help other people realize their vision, which is generally to make money. Does that sound harsh? I mean... You know, and in the midst of that, right, I have had so much fun making music that I'm proud of with my friends and trying, I mean, 110% on everything, you know? It's like I never phone it in. But I might be saying, this is so bad. But when I'm playing, I'm really trying to do my best. And I'm trying to figure out like I'm, I'm not, does that make sense? <laughs> and then the other thing is, like if you know what you're doing and why, like if you know why you're doing what you're doing, I think it'll, it'll help you sleep better at night, you know, if you, if you know your intent. And then, I, then the other thing is, is you, you just straight up have to be good enough, right? And, and some people just aren't. And they either need to quit or practice. That's just a fact. Some people yeah. will never be good enough to achieve their musical dream because they don't have it. And they just don't have it. Just like I'm never going to be a tap dancer. Because I, I just don't have it. You know? And, and you, my, one of my daughters would say, I want to be a jockey. And I don't say, you can do anything you want to do. Anything you put your mind to. No, you're already too tall. Already. You're not going to be a jockey. Don't try to be a jockey. <laughs> you know? And, and Is that why she didn't come tonight? <laughs> and, you know, and, if, and some, sometimes people want to sing and they have a burning desire to be an artist. Sorry, your voice isn't good enough. That's a harsh reality. And then you're left with yourself as a person. And then you come back to all the things we started talking about tonight, which is having a perspective and having... That's when, if you've worked so hard, you no longer have any relationships, and you got nobody as a safety net to be vulnerable and honest with. And if you haven't done the work to figure yourself out, you don't know why you're so angry because you don't know what you really want. And 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 if you don't have a perspective on, you know, it's just a dopey job playing for a silly country act, instead of like I'm the king of the world, I'm playing guitar for X artist. If you can't keep the perspective on it, then when it goes away or you don't get it, it's crushing. So you wear a lot of hats in the music industry and you said you wouldn't put them on, on, your, on your business card. But when you say you meet another music industry type person, do you ever decide, you know, if they, if they ask what you do, do you tailor that based on what they I do answer, or what you want to I answer to them? Very vague answer first, if I don't know them. So what do you do? I do music. <laughs> like that thing. Well, what kind of thing? I'm pretty, uh, then if they say, what are you, a producer, musician? Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and then, and then I'll, I'll say, what do you do? It's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a music supervisor. And then they want to talk about themselves. Yeah, so what, like for, what, for, what, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on this show called, you know, The Ranch. And it's, oh, look, uh, cool. yeah, I, I've just been doing the music for the Nashville TV show. No kidding. You know? I've been trying to figure that one out for a while. Mm. 
Yeah. Because you, so you vague answer, ask immediately about them, find out what their need is, and see if you can fill it. Yeah, because like you said before, once someone sees you as one thing, it's very hard to be something else to them. I've kind of introduced, or I've become the wrong thing to that person that later on I wish I'd been the other yeah, thing. So, right. So, but the thing is, if that's not the biggest problem in the world if you have 60 other people. So that's that's the key, is you, do, you don't want to have two or three, you want to have the 60, and you just... What do you say no to? Mm, it depends. <clears throat> you know, it's dependent. Um, you know, there are times that I would said no to anything that that took me out of town because I just my kids were younger or whatever. Um, right now, um, I'm going to say no to music that I have contempt for. You know, like. <laughs> If I would kind of, if it makes me roll my eyes that it even exists, <laughs> you know, and, and and I don't think it's good for society. I'm not gonna tell you what that is, especially not on the mic. But if I, you know, then I just think, you know what? I'm not gonna tell anybody not to like music, you know. Everybody should, but I'm just not gonna to contribute to that. Um, so I would say no to things that were too easy for me. Thing I would say no to things that five other people could do. You know, like you could call this person. This is, if somebody comes to me and I go, "This is so in my wheelhouse. I'm such the right call for this," then I'm I'm gonna do it. Um, you know, I would say I would say no to stuff that that. De devalued maybe my what my rate should be um, <clears throat> I might say no to things that had a crew of people that I didn't think I was going to feel comfortable with for whatever reasons but for many years the answer was nothing I said yes to everything everything so there were many years when I mean I, I was scheduled for f five nights. I, I found out this woman was the high priestess of the Tennessee Wiccans. And we were doing like ceremonial like witchcraft songs. And I was like, you know, I'd finished out the first night. <laughs> and I was like, man, it's kind of creeping me out, you know. <laughs> it's not, you know, and I was really nice about it. And I said, you don't even have to pay me for a night, but I, I can't do the rest of the week. It's just, you know. And that's, that's the only thing I've, I've pulled off of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> did you have someone to recommend? Yeah. Yeah, did you, you had, yeah, you yeah. had a backup. Yeah, that's great. You really want to help you find somebody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had this crystal and you. Were <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. But I, t I tell you this much <clears throat> there are people whose careers I look at and I think, man, I'm kind of envious of that. And most of the time it's because of what they said no to. I mean, I have a really long discography, and there's a short list of the stuff that I'm really super proud of, you know? And there's something to be said for just like, man, it's great to just know that, you know, um, somebody's listening to, you know, I don't want to demean it, but this particular recording, you know? And it's not my cup of tea, but um, I'm just glad to be just making a significant impact on the history of recorded music in my generation. And that was my goal for a long time, to make a significant impact, quality and quantity, on the history of recorded music. And it's kind of like, okay, you know, so you get a certain amount of records, you go, that's significant enough. <laughs> you know? I kind of want to do something that really brings me a lot of joy, you know. That's a good answer. Something that doesn't bring me joy. Because I'm starting to feel the age thing. Like, I'm going to do this forever. You know, I did a three-hour session the other day and I was like, this was not fun. I should not have said yes to this. 
And next time I'll respectfully decline. Say, oh man, I wish I could do it. I, I, no, I can't do it right now. I was going to try to figure out a good analogy for this question I was about to ask, but the only one I can think of is food. Yeah. Uh, so in this question that I was thinking of, uh, let's say you wanted to become a chef and you spent 10 years studying to be a chef, cooking thousands and thousands of meals. And now it's just you at your house. You make a professional meal every single night, and it's just you eating it by yourself. Is there ever a time in your career where you felt like you had professional skills, but just no one was knocking the door, and you just didn't yeah. want to share it with anyone? Yeah, I very much felt uh, underutilized and underappreciated for since I was about 12. <laughs> what, what do you do? Uh, How do you share your meals? You know, there were just a lot of, lot of situations where I thought, man, I think I'm offering something here, but I have something better to offer, and it's not here. But I don't know how to be there. Yeah. But then there were times where I felt like, man, I was such the right person for this. And I'm so glad that it worked out because they wanted something and I could deliver it and I was passionate about it. I'm so proud of it. You know, the Foy Vance record, that's for me, it's like that, okay. You know, that something else, you know. The Nashville TV show, didn't know it. I was like how much I would enjoy it. Like that was a good fit. That worked out okay, you know. Um, I understand your analogy, um, and I just want to talk about food for a second, in that I love watching, I, I get a lot of inf inspiration off of food shows. I'm not a, I don't cook, but, I, I, but I'm a foodie. And I just love the watching people take ingredients, the common ingredients, piano, bass, drums, guitar, to four, four bar phrases, four beats to the bar, 12 notes, <laughs> you know? Take common ingredients and combine them in new and surprising ways to, to, to surprise and delight people and fuel them. I'm a big believer in, in the usefulness of music, like poems, like that poem is useful to me, you know? Meaning like it's something I can turn to. That prayer is useful to me. I can memorize prayer that I can go back to because I... I need it. I got to return to this thing. I'm going to use these words that somebody else wrote in this poem or this quote to fuel me. And I think music that it's like, this is useful music to me. This helps me unwind. This helps me rev up. This helps me want to work out today. This helps me empty the dishwasher. This helps me grieve, you know, my mother dying. This helps me, you know, this helps me to be in love better. This helps me to um, be sad about my breakup better. That's useful music, you know. And um, music for television is also very useful music because it supports story. And I think that's why I enjoy it because it has a real purpose. It's not in a vacuum. And neither is cooking. It has a real purpose. You want to share it, you know? Wouldn't it be a lot of fun to make a meal at home and <laughs> eat it? You know, you want to you do it with friends. And it's so good. This is so rich. We all have to go home and go to bed at some point. Yeah. So um, I think I'll, I guess, does anybody have a just burning, burning thing they absolutely must ask? I want to cut you guys off. Because I have to watch Tim because I saw what he did to you earlier. I don't know if you caught this, that he switched the Q&A around and he asked you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching you, Tim. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, well, Tim, thanks so much for coming and, and spending this time with us. This has been just, just outstanding. Great, really you guys can such a great time. Feel, I'm not. You, you, you can get, find my email, and phone, whatever. You, I don't, you can call me or text me if you want. Awesome. <laughs> and you're welcome to stay. You're also welcome to leave. I know some people are kind of like don't want to get up and <laughs> to the door. So I'm just gonna say we can all stand up and converse. And, yeah. and go around. Thanks for spending some time with us here on YouTube. If you'd like to take us with you, 
Search for Music City listeners on your favorite podcasting platform. 